Hey, hey, it's Mr. A back at you with another art video. Today we're going to be diving in for Earth Day, doing some uh, sketches in watercolor of some hyacinth flowers. So I'm really excited to get started with this. Uh, and I went ahead and started by sketching out all of the pencil details for this design. Um, as you can see, I have a few of these, seeing if I can channel the spirit of these flowers on Earth Day, keep uh, everything nice and bright. And uh, I want to make sure that you guys are just, you know, enjoying this uh, just like a spring day. It's raining here in Chicago a little bit, but was able to get out for a walk. And what I find is that art is kind of my way to relax and kind of refocus and feel like I can stay productive. So if I can uh, bring you along on that journey, that would be uh, a lot of fun. So a couple things about materials today, um, just so you, if you're going to try to follow along, uh, I will be... Uh, after I process the sketch that I'll show you, I'll be uploading um, the lines for that. So if you wanted to use that and actually paint it in, transfer it to your watercolor paper and uh, make your own painting, that way you won't have to try to draw this. Um, I figured I'd save you guys some time there. But I do have um, a variety of brushes here, uh, different shapes and sizes. I'll talk about my choices for each thing. And then I also just have this uh, brush that's filled with clear water. So if you see me using this without dipping it in the water, uh, certainly um, that's where it's coming from. And then today I'm also using um, Arches water pa watercolor paper, uh, but it's a smooth grain this time. And part of it is because the surface of these flowers are really smooth and supple. So we're going to try to avoid uh, some of the bumps that you might see in some other types of paper. Uh, so let me get set up here and I'll kind of just go over our picture. There we go. All right. So my drawing set up, I, I hopefully you guys can see me mixing some of the colors. And uh, I actually put out a little bit of a request on Reddit in uh, the subreddit called Watercolor 101 and asked for some suggestions of what would be helpful. Uh, and I really appreciated some of that feedback. So if you're joining me today, thank you for joining. And um, I hope I can be of value to you guys as you, uh, you know, are working on growing with watercolor. It's something that I got really into um, really this summer, uh, sketching on site. And it's really fulfilling, but frustrating at the same time. So let's get started. Uh, this sketch, like I said, I was working with um, a pretty light pencil, so it might be a little bit difficult to see. Uh, but we are going to start by just kind of um, putting some base colors in there. And if you can think of this as like the white is really represents our light in the picture. And uh, for we have to also be careful not to make anything too dark. Uh, so we're going to start with some of the areas that we can kind of fill in to give it kind of a base glow uh, underneath. And I'm going to try something a little funky on this one, especially on the green. So if you can see um, on the leaves there, I notice there's kind of like this yellow base to it. So we're going to get started, have some fun with the bright color. And I'm going to try something that's more of a flat brush. Key thing, keeping your brushes clean. Um, you know, if you have uh, dirty water, the colors are going to get muddied. So keep that in mind. All right. So I'm going to start off by putting kind of a base coat of yellow just so there's some warmth kind of radiating through. And remember, I'm making these decisions as an artist. There's no one correct way to do this. There's an infinite number of variations. And so uh, the question that I got on that Reddit feed, if you're working with uh, these cake colors um, or the pan water colors, getting to know how much water to mix with your paint is kind of a balance. Okay, this would be a really intense yellow here. Um, and the thing is, to control that, this is going to be more of a wash. So I'm trying to get this nice and diluted. I'm not going to go too crazy, but I'm actually going to complete another step here. And that is to use my brush that's filled with water. We're going to go ahead and fill in... Um, very carefully painting with clear water to kind of fill in some of these leaves down at the base here so we can get some contrast. All right. So this is filled with water already. You can do this with a brush that um, you just dip in water as well. Let's start off with one leaf where it kind of meets up with this. Now part of the reason I'm doing 
yellow is because the the flowers in this case are very um, very purple or violet kind of blue the opposite color of uh, purple is going to be yellow and especially in places like this where it's a very direct contrast where there's almost like um, the leaf is framing this first flower we're going to put in there this is going to be a really fun area to kind of put some yellow in because that purple will really pop out later if you don't know what I'm talking about no worries we'll get to uh, see it for real so I'm wetting the paper and what's cool about doing this technique is it almost sets up a fence for your colors so they're not going to run everywhere they'll certainly spread within the wet area but they sorry they will definitely um, stay within the bounds that you painted so let's use this as an example I'm gonna go back to my yellow which is a pretty intense yellow here and I'm just gonna start by seeing this kind of edge I'm gonna start at the top and just kind of drop in some of that color it's definitely pretty intense and since I have this on a board it's going to want to go down with gravity so you can kind of start with the top and what's beautiful about watercolors you can create these kind of very unique transitions to each uh, piece so just adding a little bit more of this yellow it's getting a little muddy on me which is kind of not what I expected but we'll work through it If you're having trouble getting it to spread, you can always go back in with a little bit more water and kind of coax it along. So you're adding more water to make it, you know, go live almost. And that's what is one of the beauties of this medium, but it's also something that can really haunt you if you're not wanting to do it and you're accidentally uh, are doing that so again this is just a base coat turned out pretty intense I'm okay with that again we own this picture we get to decide how it goes I'm gonna do the same thing kind of just getting you can see that there was some yellow stuck on that brush but I'm gonna bring that in to my other thing be careful of those drips if you have a tilted piece of paper but if you have high quality paper, typically it'll really absorb that stuff. And by the end of this, we probably won't see much of this yellow in the end. It's really going to be more of a uh, just a subtle warmth you're going to see kind of coming through those flowers. Um, maybe I'll put some on the back side of this. Notice how I'm just kind of casually putting that warmth in, maybe even along the edge of these flowers here. There was another question on Reddit about like getting some, um, well, two things. Number one is like, how do you protect your whites? Um, which is a topic we'll be covering. Put a little bit in this stem. Uh, but if there's an area you see that is pure white, definitely want to leave that blank that's half the battle with your watercolor and again this isn't about shading this is just kind of breathing some life into what's going to be green but there'll be some warmth behind it so if we don't paint it with green it'll kind of do that and then some of it will also show through we also talked about how it would actually pop out against this purple slash violet remember it's art so you don't have to worry too much about exact representation nature does a better job than all of us combined so 
no worries about that. So the key thing with working in watercolor is thinking almost in reverse. If there's an area that you want to stay light, you got to keep it light from the start. So identifying those areas is going to be important, but then also working, keeping that in mind. So for example, this got a little saturated on us. That's okay. I'm not too worried about it. Um, maybe I'll just throw a little bit in this part of the stem just to help me pop out some of these details. Probably all get covered up later on. Okay. So while I have these relatively wet, this is a good time to start creating some interesting transitions uh, that will serve us a little bit later. So just like I did with the yellow, it's kind of already active. I'm going to, we want this to be somewhat of a smooth mix. We want the paper to do some of the mixing for us. So while it's wet, I'm going to use the same brush, but I'm going to start off with this green. Another Reddit comment I had was saying that my painting that I did last time got a little muddy. I, and that's partially because I mixed some brown in. So I'm going to try to avoid using too much brown in this. Okay, so this is a pretty intense green. Let's go for it. Um, I guess we'll just, we'll try something like this. I'm noticing that there's really not a lot of water there because it's just dried up. So I'm going to soften up that edge with a water brush. Let that water work for me. So we're adding these kind of washes of color. But I'm trying to put it into the darker areas. So leaving that other middle part a little bit more yellow. So you see how that kind of just softly blends in. Now this is a little more wet. I might have a little bit more luck with this. So I notice there's a little bit more green over here. We'll let that kind of blend in. But then along this side, we can go back and get a little bit more. We'll certainly have to get a little darker, I think. But as the leaf curves over here, we see a little bit more but I'm not gonna get too obsessive about it just yet so let's try this one there's a leaf I kinda of forgot about I'm getting this wet with my water brush but painting in the water is still kinda of wet as well so it might bleed a little bit into the other shape but let's try it out that's definitely using gravity to its advantage I'm even going to get a little bit of a darker green in there because that's definitely a dark area. So see how that, oh, see, I kind of messed up with my stem there, but we can do a little bit of coaxing. So to the question of like, what do you do if this happens to you, right? You don't want to have this happen if it was unexpected. So what is there left to do? Well, you can do a lift and that could be done with either paper towels or a dry brush, a dry clean brush, I should say. So I got this uh, round brush. I'm going to see if we can pull some of the water out of here. I'm actually drying this off. I'm also blending it a little bit with a dry brush technique. That actually looks kind of cool. So if there's some water sitting around, you can certainly do this. But I like some of that smooth transition. There's something about it that I like. And now that I have this green on here, maybe I can even use this. to shade in some of the other pieces. Okay. 
can get a little bit of green over this one with these streaks. You see I have kind of this dry brush technique and it's emulating that kind of streak look on here. We want to make this seem free flowing as much as possible. We needed to bring this into more of a green anyway. So let's uh, use our water brush and play with that a little bit more. So I noticed that this has to get a little darker here. And I'm making judgment calls based on how I see the paper behaving. If it's dry, too dry or too wet, you got to adjust your techniques accordingly. I see a little bit of a white streak on the outside of here, so I'm going to keep that relatively light, or I'm keeping it dry right now just so it doesn't kind of mix in. So I'm going to try that green again. I'm using it on this dry brush. We'll see if we can get some more streak technique here. I'm just like lightly dusting that in. There's definitely some over here. One of the things to keep in mind about watercolor is you don't want to overreact if you make a mistake. Let it dry, think about it for a second, or move on to a different part of your painting, and that way you won't get freaked out and end up making a mistake that you wish you would have avoided. So sometimes frustration is your greatest enemy for these pieces. But I'm hunting for dark areas that I can kind of fill in. But when I say dark, I'm just using a darker more saturated green instead of like dulling the stuff out. Let's create, let's bring in this like darker one over here. We're going to be filling it in behind some of these areas. So I'm protecting the um, flower petals there. We're going to make this one darker so this front one stands out. I want to get that shape correct. So I got two parts of it that'll have to go around these flower petals. And I'm gonna just use that darker green. I got this dry brush, it's gonna get wet in a second. All right, that's going in there. There's quite a bit of water. Maybe that's a little bit too much, but that's okay. But do you see how there's this little light streak here to show separation from that other area. So let's try a paper towel lift. So see how I have this kind of bubble there that's popping up. It's giving me a little bit more water than I need. So what I do is I take a paper towel and just touch that water area and it'll lift up quite a bit of it. It might pull out some paint as well. So you got to be careful if you were planning on it being dark. But that way you won't get those big, kind of like, like a dried coffee stain effect. You don't really want that. All right, let's go back to maybe this brush here will give us a little more control. I'm going to do some darker areas up here. Uh, we'll, con we'll continue with this technique to do all of the stem just because we want it to look all the same kind of all the same form so I'm adding that water might be a little bit too much there but okay going all the way up and this is where we're going to get a little bit darker eh, actually we'll just stick with this green because we can always add stuff later. So I'm starting at the top because that water will kind of come down. But these are definitely more in shadow so you can kind of relax with those. Getting that darker green into that shape we want. So notice how I started with this Thing that kind of goes in between it's like a an in and out 
that's kind of one of the challenges of watercolors since we can't really they're not opaque so they won't cover very well you'll always kind of see part of it underneath you kind of have to do the background first so that other things have the appearance of popping out and we certainly have quite a bit of water there so we might have to lift some out But this is why you want to spend some money on some decent paper because it'll hold these edges of water really well. Um, I guess for the stems, we didn't really do this one. I am going to get this real quick while I have the greens out. Creating a step of you know some separation between each leaf is a good thing you know that's overlap so we're creating some edges for ourselves and i want to dry this green out a little bit meaning add some yellow so i got this stuff over here i'm going to take some of this yellow i might even take a little bit of orange because these are some more neutral, so it's a little bit more brown. I know I said I wouldn't do brown, but we're still keeping that green. Toning it down, and remember, my water is already wet. Or sorry, my paper. <laughs> water is already wet. That's something that we can count on. Yeah, I'm just going to clean up a little bit of this little drop of water. And I'm just going to wet this edge so it doesn't accumulate. All right, here we go. We're going to get that nice edge. We're basically dropping that color down. See how it pools up there? We can coax it down with some more water because it'll pull that all the way down. So notice I didn't have to really blend it on my own. It's a little darker than that, so I'll just put some more in. Use gravity to my advantage. Even leaving a little bit of a light spot that I can fill in later with something else. Because the wetter it is, the more it's going to spread. And we got one more over here that I added for fun. It's got a little bit of life to it. I'm going to put, see how it's bleeding into that other one? Wasn't expecting it to, but that's okay. We'll take a little bit from here along this edge. Let it bleed just a little bit with that water brush. I'd have to say that this having a brush with water in it is has changed my <laughs> the way that I look at this stuff. It's so much easier. You're not always going back and forth. And it keeps your water that you're adding to your drawing a lot clearer. Right? Because if you're just dipping in one little pot of it, it can be a little bit annoying. Putting that lighter, kind of more electric green on this edge. All right, so we got quite a few greens going on here, and this is where we're going to get to the fun part. So the question of these flowers, what color are they? Well, first off, I want to challenge you to really not think of that there's any black in this painting at all. Um, but I can see several colors in those flowers. Um, the flowers that I'm looking at have not only like blue, like almost like turquoise, especially if you look um, the flower down here where it crosses over in that like bulb part at the back, some kind of turquoisey blue. 
some beautiful purple, but it usually is at the inside of the flowers, and then it kind of moves outward and gets blue, almost blue mixed with white um, to come down there. So how would we approach that? We're going to try to stick with a set of colors that we can work with for the whole time. Uh, and I'm going to start with the darker stuff. So I'm going to start with that purple. We're going to work our way out. There's another part to this that is a little bit difficult. We have to actually do some line work to show those subtle little creases in the um, flowers because they show that direction, how they curl. And so that can be kind of fun. Um, I'm going to do a really small brush with this. And you could probably, instead of going on with the same technique we had here, because these are pretty precise, I want to be able to focus on this. I am going to um, do the line work first with kind of like a, a delicate purple. And then I will um, do a wash over the top after those dry. Okay, So we'll do like three washes. One is going to be the detailed lines. Second one is going to be kind of like the purplish shadows. And then the final wash will be kind of like those lighter bluish hues on the outside. Okay, so the brush that I'm going to use for this is a Sable Kalinsky Round. This is really good for doing details. Um, I also have another one that might be just as good. Um, so I'll probably be switching between those. I'll make sure that they're clean. And we'll kind of start looking at some blues and purples or violets that we could use. So I'm going to get some blue out on the palette here. This is ultramarine blue. So I'm just working the water into that cake there. And this is really strong color, right? So it's going to kind of like, if we put that on there, it's going to be the strongest thing on it. That's really intense. So we don't really want to get too carried away with that. But I am going to also go over here to this purple that I have. I wish I knew. Oh, that's not even purple. <laughs> that's what? Thalo? Sorry, guys. I'm like spacing right now. Okay, here's the purple. There we go. That's almost an electric color. So you got to be really careful not to do anything too intense. And, uh, you know, now that I'm looking at this, this color here, looks like I haven't used it much. It's almost a mix between green and blue, right? Yeah, I think this is thalo blue. So that could be something else that we use to darken up some of the areas so it's not so intense. All right, so I want to get a more diluted mix over here. So I have some fresh water right there, and I'm just taking from this to mix out a little bit of what I see here. So it's about half of the intensity that I was thinking before. Now the darkest spots that I see, and I'm just going to try to stick with those, are those kind of central holes in the flower. So if you look you know, at each one, there's definitely some shadow areas, but I'm going to get close. Let me see if I can, while we're doing the flowers, I'll blow this up for you. Give me a second. I think that should help. Let's see. There we go. So you can see a little bit better into those areas. The deepest kind of points are definitely underneath some of these petals. So I'm going to go in. And, you know, if I was trying to do this really precisely, I would probably have a test sheet of paper before I go in with any of these colors. And I'm really just focusing on that edge there. And you're going to see how that's going to pop out some of these flowers. I'm not even going to do like the lines outward. So here I notice there's just like a triangle. That's the darkest point of the flower. And for each one, you can do that. Kind of just pick out a dark area. This is certainly not the darkest blue we can do, right? Along this edge here. 
it's almost these lines that stick out, but there's definitely shadows in here. The shadows aren't black. They're definitely a bluish purple. We'll go into this one. Those are the main ones here down here we also see it very along this this flower petal it kind of curves over here and what is this kind of described as what am i thinking about while i do this well this is what we call what i've heard call at least directionality each line that you draw can kind of tell us something about the form that you're trying to represent. So if you've ever tried cross hatching and you do all parallel lines, the problem is, is they have no contour. They don't follow the shape. Uh, I've called it like um, the yoga pants of lines. They follow the shape and the form underneath. Uh, so that's what we're going to be trying to do to get some shape into these flowers. And then we'll coat it with some nice transparent washes over the top once this color dries. So now that I've done this, I'm going to start looking for those lines that are kind of directional, but they're only the ones that are dark, right? So this isn't the darkest wash I could ever do. So I'm just trying to work these things in. I'm starting at the top here, trying to get this angle, almost like I'm drawing. Goes to the center of that flower. You know, this is something that you would definitely benefit from spending time doing your drawing to show. Because you have to just look at the photo or whatever you're drawing to find this stuff. It can be very overwhelming if you don't already have some sketches in there to remind you. So I'm looking for the dark areas that show me how each one of these petals even fold over on themselves sometimes. I don't want you to do pure outlines we just want some soft shapes as it goes into the center sometimes it's not just a line it's actually like a blob we'll save those for later i'm just looking for the lines that show me the direction of each flower petal They can also show me some of the folds in, you know, that occur naturally in that flower petal or as they turn away from us, like right here. We might have to make those darker with a second coat later, but I'm definitely establishing some of that form on the shadow side of that petal. And I'm trying to take that Redditor's advice not to overpaint, so... <laughs> <laughs> We're balancing a lot of stuff here, but certainly try to find, especially where those things intersect, try to find some lines. That's another interesting thing about, you know, what lines are. Very few of them, if any, naturally occur in nature, straight lines. And if you were to look at this flower, it's not like there's a, a black line surrounding the edge. We're just simulating uh, we're using lines to describe something, help us coach our eye into the correct direction that we want. So we need to get a little bit more paint going here. And it might seem like this is going slow, but this is where it kind of pays off to go slow. And then some of those, just like we did those stems, that went relatively quick. We let the paper do a lot of the work. We will do that later for these flowers. But I'm trying to get that form so it'll look like these flowers have kind of a really supple and rounded shape. If you've noticed, because I definitely love this, these new brushes that I got, these Sable Kalinskis, they are expensive, but I've never had anything so amazing. And after you've <laughs> tried and failed to make a lot of watercolors, <laughs> having good materials is definitely amazing. So if you're going to spend some money on watercolor, I'd say first, like even if you have junky watercolors, first 
spend your money on good paper. That's the number one priority. Second, I'd say get good colors. If you want these kind of like really bright, kind of professional looking colors, you definitely want to buy something that's, you know, a little bit more pricey. You kind of get what you pay for. But then last, if you really enjoy it, brushes are kind of the last step. Uh, but they're definitely a glorious one. But you might not appreciate it if you haven't struggled through with some bad brushes. <laughs> you can also look at this almost like uh, drawing with pen and ink. Um, it's definitely probably going to be a little bit hard on your eyes to see everything I'm doing here, but we may even have to break this up into multiple videos if it's going to take this long. That's the one thing about watercolor that I love is like you think like, oh yeah, this is just going to be a quick one. And then you're there two hours later obsessing over some detail. It's usually a good thing you want to get the best result you can but that's where the time goes right all right so the next thing I'm going to look for you can start to see how those flowers have a little bit more form you can see them kind of wrapping around uh, it's not totally complete uh, and maybe I'll do a few flowers here just to show um, the full process but I want you to look at this flower as it overlaps. So like over here, kind of this flower in the picture. See how it's nice and blue, like a haunting little blue back there. It's definitely also darker in value, right, than this other one. So just like we did on, the, um, on that other piece, we're going to be uh, certainly adding a blue wash over the top but I want to get the details in kind of that rounded body there do you see this kind of luscious little shadow in there that shows like this bulbous form but being careful not to like that shadow of it kind of helps you see the shape of this flower petal it's very subtle but that's what you want to learn to see as an artist I'm just drawing the lines there and we'll kind of cover that with a transparent wash like this and it'll just really pop later. Now don't get me wrong, you could certainly be speeding this up. Um, you know, I could probably even do this with uh, you know, purple. And I'll try to do that for you just so you don't get bored. Another thing that I've learned since starting to paint with watercolors, I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to come up with original concepts. And that's enough to drive an artist crazy. I would not recommend putting that pressure on yourself because the ironic part is that if you just look closely and try to copy what you see, you might think that you're hot stuff. You know, you maybe you've been practicing drawing and you feel like, ah, uh, I already got this down. I don't need to do this anymore. That's kind of boring. Well, once you start looking at nature, there's infinite <laughs> variation that will always have a challenge for you. And that's where, like, I kind of got burned out looking at other artists for a while. But for me, what brings it back is once you try a challenge like this to replicate nature, then you go and look up other artists that were asking the same questions like how do you make this look you know realistic or how do you bring the essence of this thing forward that's when you start to really appreciate art and that's why i think that making art can be a really effective way to um you know learn about it even if you don't like the result that you're getting you're certainly going to um appreciate what the artist went through to make the stuff that you enjoy looking at.
So again, I know I got started right away today. I want to take some time to thank everyone for joining, um, especially those of you who may be new. Uh, I've been doing this uh, show for, I guess this is our 21st episode, which is hard to believe. Started during the beginning of the uh, containment, kind of the uh, self isolation. <laughs> it's given me something to do. Uh, and I appreciate you guys following along because this brings me much, much joy. I'm always happy to answer your questions if you are thinking about getting some materials or if you enjoyed something or didn't enjoy something I always love hearing your feedback okay so let's see how we're doing on time here we're already almost at 40 minutes, I'd say. So we may have to do an episode two on this. Oh, but the last thing I wanted to point out, we talked about the start of this show. If you are continuing to watch on Saturday, I'm going to be having a guest on. So if you haven't followed me on Instagram, now's the time to do that. I did make a small change to the channel. It's just art with Anderson, just like the YouTube uh, channel spelling. Um, but if you want to, that's a great way to hear of new updates and I'm going to be starting a kind of a separate little series where I'll be inviting uh, fellow artists uh, and creatives on and doing a little bit more of like a talk show format where we talk all things art. You know, how did you get to this point in your career uh, and having a little fun along the way. Uh, so that's going to be on Saturday at 3.30. Would love to have you join in. We're going to be having... Um, friend of mine has been a sports photographer for the uh, MLB uh, for the White Sox for some time and um, now does that um, almost full time. Uh, unfortunately, some things changed with this containment, but uh, has some beautiful work and we'll be featuring him. Um, obviously, if you have questions about what, it, what it's like to be a sports photographer, he is a very informed and fun person to uh, have so I'm honored to have him as my first guest so I'd love if you guys could join us for that all right so what are you guys thinking here look at how much this creates that sense of overlap you know just with these simple drawing lines I, I certainly spent about an hour and a half I'd say drawing uh, the lines that I needed and the overlaps uh, so this is going much faster believe it or not than it would have if you know we were just doing this from the photo but I'd spent some time looking at some of my favorite artists uh, and I encourage you to do the same maybe I'll put a link in the description uh, John Singer Sargent. He's actually an American uh, painter that painted alongside uh, Claude Monet. He was an um, incredible portrait painter, but my favorite stuff is his watercolors. During um, some of his travels, uh, one of them to Venice, Italy, he did some incredible watercolor um, that's just it's hard to believe that it's watercolor. It's so convincing, but it, the brush strokes are so loose. It looks like he just dashed it off, but it comes together to be almost more real than looking at the actual thing. Um, so a great place to see any of this artwork. If you're just looking at like, oh, I want to learn how to do a certain technique, check out Google Arts and Culture. If you've ever, like, they used to have it so you could see, like, every museum indoor. Um, that's essentially what it is. But if you look up John Singer Sargent and some of his watercolors, you'll see what I'm talking about. That's kind of like my next ambition is to do some master studies where I kind of go through and try to replicate his artwork. Uh, because it's just so incredible. And... But the other thing about that is do not be fooled. He did not just dash them off. He definitely does. If you look closely, 
He certainly does a drawing first. Because I first thought that he was just that much of a genius that he could just like slap the paint on and <laughs> just go for it. Uh, but that is not the case. So don't get discouraged if you look at it and you're like, I could never do that. But you can if you put your mind to it. So, all right. So I, my favorite part, I kind of talked about this uh, with the daffodil painting that we did uh, last week, is those bulbous forms on the back of the flower. Something about that is just a very seductive form. But notice that sometimes I don't outline the entire flower petal. I'm just focusing on the areas that are the darkest because we want to save those areas. So if you look at uh, this one right here, it's really the darkest on this side over here. I'm leaving those pencil lines to help me out, but I also can put this rounded line here, just a little sliver of a line, just a hint that that goes around. And there's just a little bit of a thing right here. It'll give the eye a little bit of a bridge to jump there to help that come through. Uh, and then you could also just see this line that kind of comes underneath, and that shows us where that jumps off. Same thing on this piece. Here's the edge of this flower, but it's got this shape right here. This is actually a light area, and there's another shadow area that I'll actually darken in because that whole little thing kind of folded around, and then there's another light part there. So we're sculpting the form of all of these flower petals and even compared to you know the daffodils we did you know what four flowers here we have <laughs> quite a few more than that so if anything I just hope this was relaxing for you to watch if it's stressful for you to watch I am sorry about that too but I promise that art like if you are relaxed by watching someone like Bob Ross do a painting, the trick is being able to stay that relaxed while you're painting and enjoy the process. Because if you're just getting frustrated the whole time, it's no fun. And if you're getting frustrated, the best thing you can do is walk away for a few minutes or start on a different piece. Talked about how you can be your own worst enemy and that comes in the form of literally working hastily, kind of making a mistake that you shouldn't have. You knew better by trying to overwork a piece. Another thing that I'm interested to see uh, if you tune in on Saturday, is with my guest. I want to talk to him about how he deals with those issues of patience. Or especially as a sports photographer, how do you deal with having to sit in the rain, you know, on a rain delay or something? Painting you can usually do from the comfort of your own home. Although John Singer Sargent was definitely working outdoors, like Monet. It certainly brings stuff back to the studio, I think. So if you look closely at these forms, you'll see me kind of do these parentheses shapes, the curves. You want to get that profile. It's a soft edge on these flowers. And the biggest temptation for most beginners when they draw flowers is to have really rigid outlines, you know, but you have, it's almost, think of it like fabric. It's folding. It has these subtle little shadows and that can be frustrating, but by drawing, like think of luxurious lines. We talked about the yoga pants of lines, right? They're comfortable. They want to follow the form. You're not trying to 
you know, make rigid stuff. You want to have something be smoothed. Uh, we're almost done with this line work. And I guess I'll just go for it because I'm feeling good. If you guys are sticking with me, I appreciate it. So this might be a long episode. Some bonus content, I guess you could call it. Let's just hope the camera doesn't die. So <laughs> I have no idea if that'll happen. <laughs> I think this will be a candidate for a time lapse in the end. So, but I appreciate you guys joining as always. Another technique I'll, I definitely want to explore. I had some other suggestions that I'll mention. So coming up in future episodes, I want to talk about uh, texture, uh, creating texture in your pieces, especially with watercolor. Um, eventually I will be doing acrylic and oil. The reason I haven't so far is because um, they're definitely much longer projects. And then secondly, all of my materials are kind of stuck in an area that I can't get to due to quarantine. So I guess we're out of luck for a little while. But as soon as that loosens up, I will gladly start oil painting again. The one thing I do have is an airbrush. Maybe we can bust that out. We can do, oh, and then texture wise, instead of just doing like these lines with color, right? You could actually do like pen and ink. If you get some waterproof pen um, or you get some India ink, you can do an ink drawing and then color it in, kind of mixing in your line work. So the cross hatching or cross contour hatching, that can be really cool. I've been meaning to try it. So maybe we'll do one of those. So see how my strokes kind of like radiate out. They're gentle. Doing this with a really thin brush is also, you know, makes it feel like a pen. So, all right, as we try to wrap these up, okay, I'm just trying to get, like we mentioned, the lines to show us some form. We can always go back and add more. Uh, we also want to show a little bit of overlap. You know, where are the, what's the direction that these things go in? I'm not filling any areas that have to stay light. I'm actually focusing on shadow areas especially where they kind of curve around. Not worried too much about shading as is, but just really more about getting some forms in here. I will do a little bit of shading over here. That's definitely a darker area. Uh, so what are we going to do next? We're going to be glazing these things. Now that the nice thing is we've been working for a while. Most of these flower lines are pretty dry, I'm guessing. So we'll have some luck just getting the rhythm of those pieces established. But now we can just put some nice washes over the top. missing this flower has definitely a little bit of a stuff here again this is probably a little light but that's the tough part about um, watercolors you want to be kind of cautious as you approach if you go overboard there's really no way 
uh, to pull back. All right, so you can see that some of them are a little darker than others. I was really pushing the amount that was on my brush, you know, kind of going until empty. Uh, but I'm just going to put a little bit more dark here. So this would be like my first set of glazing, right? I'm just getting dark where it needs to get darker. Now we're going to switch to this purple. We'll see if we can get some of those things really to pop out. We'll probably end after that, and then I can submit my final drawing. Hopefully I won't overpaint it this time <laughs> uh, on Instagram. So I'm just hunting for those dark areas, almost as a reminder. Okay, now let's switch over to a little bit larger brush. I'm going to take my purple this time, and I'm just going to make it a pretty thin wash because we're going to do multiple layers. I'm going to take out a little index card here. I want to test how intense this is. Well, that's all right. We're going to try to make this a delicate painting. So what I'm going to do is look for not the perfect, like the actually dark, dark areas. I'm just looking for the medium dark areas that are more purple. So it's still going to be around there. So I'm just going to give some general shape. So I'm going over some of those shapes here and giving some of those softer, larger shadows. So it's almost like burying that other part. It's going to help us sculpt those areas, bringing some shadow into it. But we're going to try to stick a little bit closer. You can do some line work as well. So we're working outward from the center. Remember, we haven't used black yet. I'm going to try to avoid it at all costs. But can you see how we created a little bit more form? The lines help us do it. And then we kind of complete the look here. So we're going into our dark areas and kind of pushing it a little bit more out from there. We're not going all the way. We're just trying to sculpt some of those shapes you still see. Because that purple really sticks to that inside of the flower, it seems like. As it moves outward, it turns a little more blue. So the other part we talked about in a lot of painting is just learning how to see like an artist. That's half the battle sometimes. What are you looking for? It could be a deep philosophical question, or it could just be literally what an artist does all the time. What do you see? you got to trust that. Trust your eyes. Don't paint symbolically. Paint what you see. When we say like symbolic painting, we're talking about, you know, a smiley face. It's not how you draw a face, right? It represents one. It's a symbol. So if you think of a flower symbol, it might look way different than, you know, somebody might put in a, a daffodil. Somebody might put in a hyacinth. Somebody might just put in like a, you know, a daisy, something basic. But if you do these pieces you'll find yourself noticing a lot more uh, detail and you might be more interested when people say you know stop and smell the flowers or whatever you'll definitely be not just smelling but you know looking at those things So notice how that light, right? We're working through those darks. And I just want to kind of cheat, and I'll show you uh, over here. Remember we put that yellow down, and we want to check out how this is going to really give a tight edge up against this flower with the purple. Let's see how it looks. I'm taking some fresh stuff here, and that outer edge of these flowers is definitely 
purple. When an opposite color is located next to its opposite, it amplifies each other. They kind of vibrate. So both of them look more intense. So if you're noticing that the transitions are a little bit too intense, we can go in with a even lighter wash if you want later, right? That's what glazing is. It's kind of building up these forms with transparent coats of color. Kind of establishing some gentle transitions between colors. But I'm protecting the lightest areas of the painting and not letting any of the color that I use kind of infect that area because that's my most valuable resource as a watercolorist. So you can see that we're starting to develop some of that form and um, it has kind of gone a little bit longer and EH, thanks so much. Kate, thank you for the compliment. Um, you know, so this is kind of getting a little bit longer. Um, you know, if you'd like, I could certainly uh, do a second episode um, or maybe record myself and just release it as a non-live video. Uh, but, you know, again, I better get going here because we're a little bit over an hour. Um, and what I'll do for the next steps is just like we talked about here, where you can still see the blue underneath these transparent washes we'll be building up some more of that uh, transition. Um, so I'll paint for a few more minutes and then, um, you know, if anyone wants me to, I don't know. Sorry, I'm being indecisive here. Let's see, it's 4.30, so we're at an hour. Oh, what the heck, I'll just keep going uh, while I have the paints out, whatever. Okay, more purple. So we're darkening up some of those shadow forms. And uh, so a few things, if you're still watching, I'd love to hear from you. Um, give me a shout out. And um, maybe if you have a favorite artist or something that you have a question about this painting or materials, I'd love to hear from you. If there's anything that I can help you with on air, I can certainly do my best to help you out. Okay, so if you're wondering how I'm deciding where to put this stuff, for example, these got a little intense for my taste, but that's okay. There's kind of our primary shadow forms. Um, and I, you hear me say the word form a lot. So what's the difference between a form and a shape? Well, form is a three-dimensional object. A shape is two-dimensional. As a painter, you're constantly working with shapes. So how is it that you can make a form? Well, we're creating the illusion of form, not an actual form. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. Right, so we're always working with shapes, but we can control things like transparency, which relates like value, how light or how dark. But for watercolor, it's your transparency is basically how much water versus how much paint is in there. And you should have a card to test it on, you know? Does that compare to what we had before? Yes, so let's keep going. Especially if you have to remix your color or it dries out, that's always something you have to keep an eye on, right?
Now there is a possibility that we didn't go dark enough on the first pass. So the cool thing about these transparent washes is they get successively darker as you layer them up. So I'm going to add a little bit more of a mix here. I'm going to get that purple going. And I'm going to really just kind of crank some of it into these dark shadows. We'll see how it's going. So you see how that dark area is even darker than that blue. So it really pushes back that space. And some of these lines need to be re-emphasized. It's a really intense one, so I'm going to give myself the option of kind of a more diluted version up here. But we definitely need to darken up some of these areas. It'll just really help make it appear that there's like a little pocket there. Just keep in mind that once it's wet, it's definitely going to change its shape, you know, or it'll kind of stay active. So if you're working from a wet area, you got to be careful that it won't spread if you don't want it to. So you see how we get that illusion that's kind of curving out. So the areas that are a little bit farther away. Now those look a little bit sharp. So I'm going to experiment with something. So see how it looks a little sharp right here? It doesn't look smooth like it does in the picture. I'm going to take my water brush out and I'm just going to add some water along the edge of that form. And then I'll soften it up quite a bit. So you can work with some of it. If you get to it fast enough, you can almost, you know, reactivate that pigment. And honestly, maybe it's time to start doing that. So let's try the top of this particular thing. There's definitely more blue at the top. So I'm going to create some water up here. Just going to leave it there for a minute. Now I'm going to take my, that blue is just so rich. Um, I'm tempted to use this blue here. It's just like, it's not the cold blue. It's almost like warm. There's something about it that's really cool. I'm just going to put that here. Get that ready to go. So see how it's preloaded in that shape. So it's kind of full of water there. And then I'm going to kind of bring it down right over the top of this purple. So it's blending over the top. I kind of like that but not for every single area maybe just you know for some things like what's over here there's some of it's just kind of sneaking up on my brush but i'm leaving some areas that are perfectly white that have more of the cooler area it's not everywhere that's for sure there's something about it there's definitely some right here It's definitely even darker, so I'm making this little bulb like wet there. I'm pulling a little bit of that blue. I almost put too much water on there. I'm going to take some out before it drips. Oh, 
the reason I say I took put too much on there is because it kind of washed out some of those initial shadows. I can put those on later, but you can kind of see how we're just creating a little bit more variety in this piece. Hunting for areas that you could add you know, that color just to sneak it in. Now I'm adding a little bit more here to make that pop. I could certainly darken up this area here after that dries. There's definitely some blue over here. So I didn't add the water, I'm just glazing it over the top of those purple shadows. I think that worked a little better, so there's not so much water reactivating what's going on. See how that just really popped in, you can still see the shadows. We can do successive coats of that as it gets a little... Uh, more so so one way that I think about painting is number one is you don't need to worry about making it look like a photograph. In fact, the photograph, you know, photography is important, but it's not the goal of a painter to just emulate a photograph. So what's their job? To me, that job is to put little secrets into a picture right and kind of reveal it slowly to the viewer like what i love about this there's a quiet little secret in that it's this little blue it's like nice and electric it's hiding in there where you think of most people are thinking these are hyacinths they're purple or they're violet but we're hiding these little strategic things in there and just you know blasting people without even them knowing they're like what's going on in there right so I'm going to try to go back in with a little bit of purple here just so we can get some more contrast. But it's amazing how much more dark I think we need to make some of these areas. And I'll be doing that um, maybe later today, but we'll probably wrap up in the next two or three minutes. And let's say that I do see some brown or something or what I think is black. Doesn't mean I have to use it. All right, like you're in control. This is your interpretation. So don't submit to the pressure of what you see in the photograph. You get to decide how you want to present this picture. So with that little philosophical reflection, I think we're about going to call it a day. But if you've joined me the whole time, I really, really appreciate you sticking with me. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and again, if you have suggestions for upcoming videos or you can think of an interesting guest, you know, I want to start bringing in other creative people, not just me, uh, that would enhance our conversation, help us grow. Uh, as artists. Um, but most of all, again, this is about you and um, I appreciate you joining me today. It really means a lot. It gives me something positive to focus on. And even if you didn't do this today, be sure to get outside if you're allowed to in your area uh, or even if it's just a little place that is, um, you know, open a window and just kind of inhabit this idea. Remind yourselves that we're on this beautiful place called Earth on Earth Day here. And, uh, and celebrate that. And if you can bring some more beauty into the world by reflecting on the nature that surrounds you, even in the most unexpected places, I think this will be um, a really great way to find relief in this you know, somewhat stressful time. 
So I really appreciate it. Thank you again. I'll look forward to seeing you guys again on Saturday when we have Dan Jallandoon, uh, the sports photographer, on. And um, I really appreciate your guys' support and trying some new things. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.